The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax for home and industry present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. How many extra uses are there for wax, anyway? Well, almost every week, somebody writes in to tell us a new one. I'm looking at a letter now that comes from a man in the drapery business. He writes, tell your friends this about Johnson's Wax. When their drapery rods don't work right, just rub on a little Johnson's Paste Wax, and they'll slide like new, with no grease to spot fine fabrics. Wax is much better than soap or candle tallow, because it won't become gummy or sticky. This would save people like me making unnecessary service calls. Well, now, if your drapery rods don't work smoothly, why not try this suggestion? And while you have your Johnson's Wax out, put some on your picture frames and lampshades, your metal ornaments, and especially on your windowsills. Johnson's Wax protects the finish of woodwork and furniture just as it protects your floors, at the same time saving you work and making your home more beautiful. The glowing wax film itself takes the wear, and the surface underneath is safe. Johnson's Wax is available in three forms, paste, liquid, and cream wax. Around the average house, there are enough petty details to drive an ordinary man to ginger ale. For instance, take a look at the daily schedule of the Squire of 79 Wistful Vista. 8 a.m., out of bed, wash face, brush teeth. 9 o'clock, breakfast, read paper. 9.30, back to bed. (laughs) 10 o'clock, up again, shave, shower, dress, do crossword puzzle, smoke half cigar, work on ship in bottle, take short nap. Decide not to mow long. 10.30, scold wife for laundry not being back. No clean shirts. 10.31, wife says laundry's been back three days. 10.32, decide to wear sweatshirt and old flannel pants anyway. 10.33 is where we join Fibber, McGee, and Molly. Gosh, if I was smart, I'd get up early in the morning and dash down to the Elks Club. Stick around here and everybody finds a job for me to do. Morning till night. Work, 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 work. Slave my hands off. Work, work, work. Same old thing every day. (laughs) Never a minute's relaxation. What's anybody asked you to do today, dearie? Well, everybody... uh, Huh? Oh, there's been a dozen of things. You keep asking me to do stuff that can just as well wait till tomorrow. Such as? Well, such as... Well, didn't you ask me to do something while we were having breakfast? Yes. Yes, I did. I asked you to put the cover back on the sugar bowl. You see what I mean? Work, work, work. One chore after another. All day long. Gee whiz. Hey, who let Beulah in this morning? I thought we didn't have any extra keys. Oh, well, Beulah stopped and had some extra ones made. Oh. Here's three of them. Now put them away someplace where you'll be able to find them. Oh, fine. Thanks. Okay. Hey, Molly, did you stop at the bank yesterday and get the dough for the FHA? Yes. It's in the desk. Three nice new $10 bills. Hmm. If you're going downtown, you can stop and make the payment. That's fine. I will. I got to get my gun repaired anyway. What gun? This old hog leg of Uncle Sycamore's. The one he used in the Texas Rangers. Heavenly days. Put that blockbuster away before I go back to kindergarten. Huh? What do you mean, go back to kindergarten? Well, every time I see that pistol, it scares me out of ten years' growth, and I've seen it four times. That's 40 years. (laughs) Oh, it won't shoot. The trigger's busted. It's a museum piece. It's historical. Yeah? Uncle Sycamore fought the Indians with this. Well, he didn't take very good care of it. Hmm? There's ten or twelve nicks in the handle. <laughs> Those are notches. Every time Uncle Sycamore would kill a man, he'd cut a notch in his gun butt. Yep. You mean Uncle Sycamore killed twelve men? Yep. All in one day, too. Heavenly days. Who were they? <laughs> they were members of a jury that convicted him of horse stealing. <laughs> So he added murder to larceny. Not at all. They sentenced him to be hung, so he shot him. <laughs> it was his life or theirs. Self-defense. The law of the Old West. He told me that one time when he was... 
Oh, hello, Alice. Hi, Alice. Hello. Has anybody called it? Jeepers, Mr. McGee, where'd you get the gun? Belonged to my Uncle Sycamore, Alice. Old Indian fighter and Texas Ranger. He was killed when his gun jammed, daughter. Yeah. The <laughs> coroner's verdict was hardening of the artillery. <laughs> Great old guy, Uncle Sycamore. Kind of a Robin Hood of the border. Used to rob the rich cattlemen and give the money to the poor sheep herders. <laughs> what you might call blameless burglary. Mm. <laughs> you mean it was a stainless steel? Oh, oh Alice. <laughs> <laughs> well, if Bert should call, which I doubt, will you let me know, Mrs. McGee? Certainly, Alice. Are you going to bed now? Yes, but I'm afraid I won't be able to sleep much. The sun is so bright and I forgot to get a new sleep mask. This one is all bent and torn. Sleep mask? Uh Uh-huh. Is that what this thing is? Yeah. Sleep mask. Looks like one of those false faces you wear to a macaroon. (laughs) You don't mean macaroon, dear. You mean masquerade. I don't any such a thing. Masquerade is that black lipstick a woman puts on her eyelashes. (laughs) Stuff that makes her look like she'd spent the day shoveling coal. (laughs) No, Mr. McGee, that's mascara. <laughs> what are you gals doing? Give me the old razzmatazz. <laughs> mascara is the capital of Russia. Ah, oh. <laughs> oh, McGee, that's Moscow. Well, then, doggone it, what's a macaroon? Well, it's a small cake or cookie. Of course it is, and they always serve them at masquerade, so what are you trying to hand me? <laughs> Well, this is a sleep mask, eh? Mm-hmm. Yes, dearie. Those are for people who have to sleep in the daytime. Mm-hmm. Keeps the light off of the island. Yes, oh. lots of us war workers use them. Is that so? The first time I ever wore one, I woke up at noon, thought it was midnight, leaped out of bed, ran into the wall, and knocked myself unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> who told you? Leave, the, leave this one with me. <laughs> you leave this here with me now, and I'll get you a new one this afternoon. Oh, thanks very much. Good night. Good night, dear. Good night, Alice. Seems a little odd to be saying goodnight at 11 a.m. Yeah. My goodness, we never know. Excuse me, folks. Is... <laughs> yeah, Beulah? There's two cops at the door. They won't see Mr. McGee. Cops? <laughs> Policeman Beulah? Say, are you in trouble, McGee? I can't think of any crimes I've committed lately. I took a paper off the newsstand last night without paying for it, but the kid knows I always pay later. You say the word, Mr. McGee, and I'll unharness them bulls like I was a female Roy Rogers. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, the both of you. This might be serious. What do you mean, serious? I haven't done anything. I don't think. <laughs> they, uh, they look friendly, Beulah? No cop ever looked friendly to me, Mr. McGee. <laughs> Even though I never bust a law in my whole life, every time I see a brass button, my spinal cord twang like an E-string. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose we better tell them to come in and face the music, whatever it is. Let them in, Beulah. Yeah, but not too fast. Stall them a while, Beulah. Talk about the weather or something. You might hint that I got a lot of influence down at the city hall. If they behave, I'll have them promoted, see? Otherwise, they'll end up as mounted policemen with their heads over my mantelpiece. <laughs> mounted policemen with their heads over the police. <laughs> mm. I love that man. <laughs> well, leave it to me, sir. I'll stall him for four minutes. <laughs> Billy Mills and the orchestra play, I'll Get By.
way, please. Mr. and Mrs. McGee, the law is here. If you need me for anything, folks, I'll be in the kitchen cooking with the heavy skillet. <laughs> well, is this a friendly visit, officers, or shall we call our lawyer, Perry Mason? I'm Hogan, ma'am. This is Dubinsky. Headquarters detail. Pleased to make your acquaintance, ma'am. How do you do, I'm sure? Well, now, this is all very cozy and polite, but before we start serving the sherbet and ladyfingers, why don't you guys break down and hand us the subpoena or whatever the bad news is? Oh, well, Dubinsky and I are selling tickets to the policeman's benefit, Mr. McGee. Five dollars a ticket. Uh, <clears throat> how many do you want? How many, McGee? Are you kidding? <laughs> do I look dumb enough to pay any part of a fin to see a bunch of tavern tummied, muscle-bound, handcuffed rattlers shaking their fallen arches around a third-class ballroom? <laughs> bah! <laughs> not a chance, boys, not a chance. Well, if it's for a benefit, McGee, we might take a couple No, and... sir, I wouldn't curry favor with a bunch of stoplight bandits for all the tea and tootie fruity. <laughs> I'm sorry, boys. And a gun in your pocket, McGee? Gun? Oh, this? Yeah. Old Frontier model. Belonged to my Uncle Sycamore. Old Indian fighter. Got a license for it? A license? Why, that revolver's over a hundred years old. So's marriage, but you still got to have a license for it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see it, McGee. Okay, but it's just an antique. Just an old shooting arm that my Uncle Sycamore... Hmm, serial number's been filed off, Hogan. That's bad. What's bad about it on an old gun like that? Are you still working on the shooting of Dan McGrew? Pipe down, lady. Don't tell my wife to pipe down, you red-faced refugee from the boys in the back room. <laughs> I got friends in the city hall that'll transfer you so far out into the sticks you'll have to report for carrier pigeon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we hear that every day, friend. Hey, there's something funny here, Dubinsky. Take a look around. Okay, Hogan. Keep an eye on them, too. They look... Take off your hat, Hogan. Uh, yes, ma'am. Now look here, McGee. About this gun. You better load your blunderbuss, Sherlock. This might be flat top. Well, whoever it is. <laughs> whoever it is, we can send a message to the mayor. Come in. Now, nah, there, good day, Mrs. McGee. Good day, McGee. Uh, goodbye, officer. <laughs> Come back here, you. Certainly, officer. I, I was merely going to perform a small favor for the fire department. What was that, Mr. Wellington? Move my car from in front of the fire plug. A fine body of men, our fire lad is. Wouldn't want to cause them any trouble in case of a conflagration or even a fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These laddies will take care of the matter for you, Wellington, when they get through with the case they're now working on. Mm, and what is that, McGee? Who killed Cock Robin? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they got three sparrows and a hoot owl lined up as suspects. <laughs> but their stool pigeon was too... Be quiet, you. What's your name, mister? Sigmund Wellington, manager of the Bijou Theater, my friend. And keep a civil tongue in your unpleasant face... Or I shall have you on the carpet so fast, you'll think you're part Persian. Well. <laughs> Good for you, Mr. Wellington. Just because we wouldn't buy any tickets to the police benefit, they think they could... Quiet, lady, quiet. Who's telling who to be quiet? Uh, uh, you mean, who's telling whom, old man? Hmm? In this instance, telling, you see, is used as a transitive verb and thus takes the object. <laughs> Even in times of stress, leave us not forget our grammar. Look, Wellington, <laughs> can you buy for these people? And, and I will. And if I hear one more uncouth remark from you, my nightstick numbskull, <laughs> I shall take great pains to see that you are transferred so far out in the country, it will take the National Geographic 12 years to discover you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. We've been through that. So you own the Bijou Theater, huh? In fee, simple. What's that? He says he owns it in fee, simple. That's a legal term. But you wouldn't understand it if it's legal. <laughs> Why did you ask about the Bijou Theater and take off your hat, Hogan? Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I was asking about the Bijou, Wellington, because your marquee extends two feet beyond the legal limit over the sidewalk in violation of Ordinance 212, Section C, Paragraph 4, Page 813 in the old book. Now, you still want to vouch for these people? I never saw them before in my life. Good day, officer. Good day, strangers. <laughs> That dirty little opportunist threw us to the wolves to save his own neck. Well, I... Hey, what's the charge against us, anyway? You either got to book us on some charge or release us. This isn't legal. I'm holding you as material witnesses, and I may charge you with carrying concealed weapon. Well, that's a oh, laugh. Oh, oh. Concealing that weapon would be like trying to hide a giraffe in a rumble seat. Quite <laughs> simply ridiculous. Hey, Hogan, you were right. This is a regular criminal hangout. Yeah, what you got? Look. 
What'd you get? McGee, look, he's got my jewelry. Why, of all the... Beach tail, you. You'll have a chance to identify it. Look, Hogan, jewelry, two wristwatches. One of them with the initials D.D. on it. Wasn't that stole from that minister last week? Don't D.D. mean reverend? (laughs) That watch belongs to my wife's uncle, Dennis Driscoll. And the other one is mine. And if either of you light-fingered Lugan so much... McGee, be quiet or I'll tap you with my sap. Go on, Davinsky. Well, there's all this jewelry, see? And here's 30 bucks in new $10 bills. Brand new $10 bills, Hogan. Like was lost when the First National was stuck up. We got those bills at the bank yesterday to make an FHA payment. Sure, lady. And these three skeleton keys that was on the desk there. I suppose those unlocked a padlock on your diary. We never claim to have a diary. We buy our milk from the Wisp of Vista Creamery. <laughs> What are you trying to do? Are you trying to... What else? What else, Tabinsky? Look what I found right here on the table, Hogan. A black mask. That's a sleep mask that belongs to our rumor. Yeah, any stoop could see there's no eye holes in it. The only thing you can hold up with that mask is your eyebrows. <laughs> no eye holes don't mean anything, friend. Might be a clever dodge to keep the victims from seeing your eyes. Oh, my this God. This is perfectly silly. Those keys are extra ones for our back door. The maid had the maid yesterday. Yeah, likely story. This is really shaping up, Dominsky. Revolver with numbers filed off, fresh money, skeleton keys, black mask, odd jewelry. Oh, gun it, you can't do this to us. I'll see the something. Stand by, Dominsky. We'll see who this is. We certainly will. Come in. Hello, folks. I was just back. Oh, excuse me. You got company, I see. Yeah, and they're about as welcome as fog at the airport. You... <laughs> We're police officers. What's your name? Why? Better tell them, Mr. Wilcox. They'd beat up their own mothers for a fig Newton. Come on, buddy. <laughs> give. Turn that light in his eyes, Hogan. That's it. They're going to give you the third degree, Junior. If you're the guy who put the lighted lantern under Mrs. O'Leary's cow, now's the time to get it off your chest. <laughs> or if you happen to know where Judge Crater Shut is... Shut up, you. <laughs> All right, what's your name? Harlow Moffat Wilcox. Moffat? Well, heavenly days. What the police don't find out. <laughs> Uh, born? No. What? They found me in a cabbage patch. They think the pixies brought me. <laughs> well, that altitude won't get you nowhere, buddy. We can always take you downtown and work you over. Where was you born? Omaha, Iowa. Omaha's in Nebraska. I know that, but I didn't think you would. You... <laughs> okay, Omaha, Nebraska. What's your racket? What's yours? Oh, Hogan and me go around here. We're asking you, smart guy. You better tell them, Mr. Wilcox, I don't like to look in their eyes. In fact, I don't like their eyes. In fact, I don't like them. Move over. I hate them, too. All right, Wilcox, what's your game? Wax. Wax, eh? I get it. You use wax to make an impression on locks. No, 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 no. I use wax to make an impression on housewives. Oh, confidence game, huh? Well, sort of, yeah. They all have confidence in me. Well, tell us about it, boy. We're your friends. This is once I'm going to enjoy myself. (laughs) Me too. Well, here's how I work, see? First, I case a joint. Yeah. Then I take my wax and go in. I use nothing but Johnson's wax, see? Why? Makes better impression? Makes a wonderful impression. When those housewives see how Johnson's wax saves them hours and hours of housework and protects and preserves so many things from dust and dampness, why, it makes an impression that lasts the rest of their lives. It's simply wonderful the way it makes a house gleam and sparkle with new beauty and cleanliness. Gee, sounds great. Where can I go buy some? Dabinsky, snap out of it. Don't let him sell you anything. Snap out of it. <laughs> where, where, where am I? What was that? Oh, all right, you get out of here. My gosh, Junior, 30 seconds more and you'd have had Dabinsky setting up housekeeping in a pink, pink apron. <laughs> in a bungalow. He's yeah. the bungalow type. Low roof. Look. <laughs> Go on, Wilcox. Beat it. And when you get downtown, Junior, please tell the mayor that... We'll we... tell the mayor. Get going, salesman. Okay, but I'll come back. Yes, and he will, too. He always has. <laughs> you Gestapo agents will soon be able to concentrate in your own camp. In the meantime, what are you staring at, Hogan? What's in that room there? What room? Oh, there. That isn't a room. That's the hall closet. Open it up, Dominsky. No, 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 gentlemen, you can't do that. Not that. Hmm. Looks like we stumbled onto something, Hogan. What's in there? Nothing. Everything. Well, which is it? Nothing or everything? Well, it's both, Mr. Dubinsky. It's everything you can imagine, but nothing you'd want. Never mind the double talk, lady. What's in that room? It isn't a room. It's a closet. And I warn you, bud, you open that door at the risk of your life. Oh, threats, eh? Well, Hogan, There's shall There's something we... in there they don't want us to see, Dubinsky. Go ahead and open it. We warned you. Okay, you open it for us. You, McGee. No, 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 no. Shoot me if you want to. But don't ask me to open that door, please. Anything but that. No, no, not that. 
The King's Men sing Old Dan Tucker. Funny old man with a funny old pan and a name and his funny old body was Dan. Yep, old Dan Tucker was a fine old man. He washed his face in a frying pan. He combed his head with a wagon wheel and died with a toothache in his heel. So get out the way, old Dan Tucker. Get out the way, old Dan Tucker. Get out the way, old Dan Tucker. You're too late, too late, too late for supper, too late for supper. What a hungry old fellow was, old Dan He fell in the fire and he kicked out a chunk. A red hot coal got in his shoe. And oh my golly, how the ashes flew. So get out the way, old Dan Tucker. Get out the way, old Dan Tucker. Oh, get out the way, old Dan Tucker. You're too late to get yourself a roll. Shorten the bread, toss him in the pan. Should be a plenty for a hungry old man. But Dan was starving for to eat. Some corn, corn with a chicken meat. He went out and stole some pullets. Come a-running home with his pants full of bullets. Get out the way for old Dan Tucker. Get out the way for old Dan Tucker. Get out the way. Get out the way. Get out the way for old Dan Tucker. Can't sit down to eat his supper now. Poor old Dan. You said poor old Dan. I said old Dan Tucker is a growing gray. The time is a coming for the judgment day. But when he gets it to the pearly gate, I hope to goodness he won't be late. Oh, get on the way, old Dan Tucker. Get on the way, old Dan Tucker. Get on the way. Get on the way, get on the way, get on the way, get on the way. He won't be late for supper on that judgment day. All right, McGee, all right, McGee. Now, for the last time, are you going to open that door or not? No, I'm not. If you want it open, open it yourself. Now, what's in there? Why are you so anxious we don't open it? You'll find out. Now, look here, lady. You'll Take be... off your hat, Hogan. You... <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, McGee, quit stalling. When I count three, you open that door, I'll slug you. I believe you would at that, Hogan. You're strictly a bruiser, fist last and always. And what's more... Oh, I never realized before how beautiful those door chimes are. Come in. Oh, Dr. Gamble. Hello, Dr. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Hello, pin-up boy. Hi, Doc. <laughs> what goes on here if I'm not too nosy? These two characters are cops, Doc. They busted in here to sell us a couple of tickets to the policeman's benefit, and we wouldn't go for it, so they started getting nasty. Yeah, for which they are eminently qualified. Aren't you men exceeding your authority a little? A little? These raisin heads are farther out of line than a cross-eyed chorus girl. <laughs> pipe down, pipe down, you. Now look, Doctor, this man got very impudent with us, officers. We found him carrying a gun with no license for it. He also had several skeleton keys, some fresh $10 bills, and a black mask. Yeah, now he refuses to open this door here. Do you blame us, Doctor? I told him they'd open that door at their own risk. <laughs> this I shall have to see. Yeah. Why, you blundering bullheaded bandits, you got a lot of moxie to come barging into a private home and browbeating two innocent citizens? Yeah, but Why, I'm... you two Neanderthals couldn't detect a sliced onion in a nose bag. I'll speak to the commissioner about you, and you'll wind up so far down on the seniority list, you'll have to be promoted five times to be a citizen. Yeah, yeah, yeah That's three times we hear that in 20 minutes Let's do something, Hogan I want to know what's in that room We told you it isn't a room It's a closet That's what you say Now look We'll give you one more chance If you buy a couple of tickets Take off your hat, Hogan uh, <clears throat> Yes, ma'am All right, McGee Open that door I won't ask you again You're a witness to this, Doc I want you to remember everything Because when I get these gorillas up Before the Civil Service Commission I'll make them squirm like a bucket of bait I'll testify, all right. What are their names again? Lugan and Budinsky. Hogan and Dubinsky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can I be any help to somebody, ma'am? No, no, thanks, Bueller. Just stand to one side so you won't be hit by flying teeth. <laughs> okay, Hogan, what are you going to do? I'm going to open that door myself. There must be something very valuable in there. Interesting would be a better word. Go ahead, Hogan. Open it up. We'll confiscate any evidence we find. That's what I was thinking. You were the kind of confiscate a red-hot stove from an orphan asylum. Shut up! Go ahead, Hogan. Okay, cover me. Cover me, Davinsky. Here we go. Well, I'll be a... You always have 
then. <laughs> so that's why. All right, McGee, just for holding out on us, I'm going to... Look out for the laundry. What's she going to... Oh. Don't you call me no laundry. <laughs> On Tuesday, I'm the cook. What's the idea of caulking my partner with that skillet, you? Just for that, I... Oh. oh. Nice going, Beulah. Nice going. <laughs> Sorry, I only brung a frying pan, sir. But I didn't know I was going to have to cook somebody's goose. Oh. <laughs> Are they breathing, doctor? Oh, yes, they'll live. But we better get a doctor right away. So they do... What am I saying? I'm a doctor. <laughs> Nice follow-through you had on that swing, Beulah. You used the overlapping grip? Yes, sir. I had to give that last one a little English on the left as he was stand kind of squeezy from it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Beulah's hauling a couple of policemen. Now we are in trouble. No, we ain't, ma'am. What do you mean, Beulah? Mr. Wilcox, he checked up on his men and slipped me a note through the back door. Huh? There ain't no policeman benefit this year, and headquarters never hear of Hogan and Dubinsky. Oh. The real cop is on the way over. These folks is rocketeers. Well, you heavenly... should be glad. You should be very glad, Beulah, Mrs. McGee prepared the ground for you. Yeah, if it hadn't been for her, Hogan would have had his hat on. Beulah, <laughs> you're the smartest one in the household. Well, is that the truth, ma'am? <laughs> Now that we're reaching the out-of-doors season, that back door of yours will be open more of the time, your front door also. That means, of course, that your linoleum floor coverings in the kitchen and front entrance hall need to be protected. And that's a job for Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. Because you not only want the linoleum protected against wear, you want it easy to keep clean and gleaming with beauty. You've practically told the glow coat story right there. Protection, work-saving beauty. The tough glow coat film guards the linoleum and surface against wear, makes it last six to ten times longer. Glow coat needs no rubbing or buffing, and therefore it takes practically no work to apply it. And because dirt and spilled things are quickly wiped up with a damp cloth, keeping a glow coated floor spotless is a cinch. And on the count of beauty, everybody knows by now that glow coat keeps linoleum colors bright as a new dollar and the floor itself glistening. For your linoleum floors, don't be satisfied with anything less than Johnson's self polishing glow coat. <laughs> What did the police say when they picked up those two hoodlums, Molly? Well, they said we should have made them prove they were real officers. Well, my gosh. Who'd have expected a couple of crooks to be selling tickets for a policeman's benefit? Yeah. <laughs> Might as well expect to find Tom Dewey inviting Mrs. Roosevelt over for a game of pin the tail on the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good night, all. <laughs> The character of Mr. Wellington heard on this program was played by Ransom Sherman. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax for Home and Industry, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night.